have to confess uh, this is when environmental de degradation becomes personal. So that if we want to have a sustainable future, uh, this, the global ecosystem must, must have it. I, I believe in non-linear change and, and a growth of a critical mass uh, so that we, yes, can come to, to this transformation that we so urgently need. The year 1992, for me, is kind of special also. This was the year when I finished my very first research, and this was conducted in South America. Therefore, I was very well aware of, of this first Earth Summit in, in Rio. I worked in, in Bolivia in that time, actually, in a very degraded uh, region, in, in the semi-arid uh, Andes. And uh, I was pretty much impressed by yeah, the severe state of, of the ecosystem, uh, shaped by well, loss of, of tree cover and uh, soil erosion and extreme uh, microclimates and, and so on, loss of livelihoods, uh, people being very poor and forced to actually leave their homes and uh, migrate as, as eco-refugees to other regions of, of Bolivia. So this was my personal start and uh, in, in this sense, uh, well, I, I thought uh, this is a worst case scenario I've, I've seen very early in my career. Uh, then I, I didn't know that things always can become worse. So even this degraded ecosystem I, I had contributed to study doing the very first vegetation assessments and, and so on over time uh, got, got worse and, and also the situation of, of the people and then, uh, well, this, this uh, topic became my topic in, in a way, dedicating myself to biodiversity studies and ever more to uh, yeah, conservation of, of remnant functional ecosystems, but also very early working on restoration and, and uh, trying to understand how to reverse the situation in, in that region. And I worked with the project, the, uh, the GTZ, the German Development Corporation, tried to uh, restore the potential, the natural potential of, of the ecosystems, also investing in nurseries and, and uh, reforestation and so on. And in a way, uh, all this failed. And, and so this was uh, also very important for me to see that there might be a, a tipping point, a threshold, when it becomes so critical that uh, it's very difficult to, to reverse situations or, or repair and, and bring livelihoods back. And uh, so this is the, the personal view from, from that time. Uh, then later on living in, in Bolivia for almost 10 years uh, until the 2000s, uh, seeing so much change also in other ecosystems, in, indeed uh, knowing that there were so many efforts of, of development projects and conservation projects and protected areas and, and so on, carbon projects. Uh, well, you might not imagine where we would stand now without these projects, but definitely uh, we know it's not enough what has been happening and it's uh, too slow. Of course, several landscapes, as I have worked on, on, on different continents and, and in different, different countries, but, but again, maybe uh, Bolivian ecosystems have been especially relevant to me. Uh, when I did my doctoral thesis, this was on epiphyte diversity, plants that grow on, on others, and, and I did a lot of work on in uh, mountainous uh, rainforests, like in, in uh, Indian uh, humid uh, rainforests. And this was, uh, well, so impressive, uh, this abundance of biomass and species and they are sitting everywhere and anywhere and um, all also, well, the biodiversity hardly understood uh, species that could not be identified. There were new species to science uh, that we found and, and so on. And uh, I worked for a long time in, in a valley in a national park, in the Carrasco National Park, uh, which is the Cervencas uh, Valley. And this was uh, about 25 years ago kind of, uh, and uh, so this is, is, has a special place in my memory, this valley. Last year I went back to Bolivia for the first time after 10 years and I wanted to visit this valley and it wasn't possible anymore. So despite being located in a national park, 
uh, access was uh, refused, uh, where I well, earlier on had collected epiphytes on, on big trees and so on. These trees didn't exist anymore. There was a camp of, of Chinese workers uh, just installing a hydro power, power plant. So the valley where I found uh, well, even new species to, to science, orchids and, and so on, did all the inventories of, of biodiversity, this valley will be flooded. For in, in, yeah, in, in the name of, of progress and in, in the name of, of uh, promoting renewable energies, uh, of course, with many unforeseen consequences. And indeed, I have to confess, uh, this is when environmental deg degradation becomes personal. So, like, the, the, it, it, when you really feel this is, uh, uh, well, changing so dramatically within a relatively short lifetime, and then it's not the only place. I mean, I remember, well, uh, the year 2011, and I walked through the forest uh, in northern Germany, where I grew up, and where I was uh, socialized, uh, possibly, or, or yeah, sensitized, where I, I got into nature and all this, and I, I found strange, the forest is looking differently. I don't remember it like that. There was so much light. And then I looked upwards, and, and then I saw, wow, uh, the dominant tree species in that part of the forest uh, was dying. And so then it's, it's getting personal, and you notice, yeah, is this normal? Is this uh, always uh, happening? No, of course not. We are now a generation that uh, is condemned to see many, many changes and, and uh, well, uh, face a lot of uncertainty regarding the future. So actually, when I started my, my career, this was uh, well, studying biology. I had uh, a lot of information on biodiversity and evolution and so on, but then all this was not changed, but complemented by working with people, uh, humans, uh, in, in Bolivia. Uh, and uh, very early on, I, I understood how dependent we are as, as a species, a component of, of the global ecosystem. And uh, it's a trivial insight, but still it seems to be so difficult to get to grips with that fact. So that if we want to have a sustainable future, uh, this, the global ecosystem must, must have it. So this is uh, an ongoing topic that we try to, to develop in teaching also and, and research. Uh, what, what does it uh, mean, this, this uh, simple fact that we are a dependent component of, of the global ecosystem? Um, if, if you really think it through, of course, all these conventional paradigms of sustainability, where we have three, three legged stool or this uh, famous uh, triangle, where we have an ecological, social, and an economic uh, well, dimension, uh, we, we have to, to ask uh, what is more important, or actually, we could recognize there is an ecological primacy, because without the ecosystem, uh, being functional, uh, there is no social and no economic sustainability. Yeah, no, this is so important to see ecosystems as entities that are permanently working, uh, uh, like, uh, well, uh, gaining energy from, from the sun, but then not only existing, but really working on, on the, uh, well, abiotic conditions, changing the soils changing, the climates, uh, and this obviously starts at the very local level, but then, as we know, uh, it's, it's uh, global, and then we would, well, come maybe to a theory, theory such as the Gaia uh, theory, so uh, the, the global ecosystem being a, a self-regulating entity, and, and we are just a depending, uh, dependent component in that. I feel there is a lot of uh, confusion regarding also ecosystem restoration, uh, where people often nowadays feel they are more clever than nature. So, of course, what we know if we really study ecosystems is they have their mechanisms of, of self-healing, self-repairing. There is this what we call resilience, uh, which is induced by by diversity, but also by the emergent properties that change uh, the, the habitat of the organisms and the components and, and so the soils and climate and so on. 
And uh, now, of course, humans have, have uh, kicked off this enormous experiment, which is the global climate change, um, anthropogenic fast the change and uh, what what ecologists or maybe they are not ecologists uh, restoration foresters often say well natural ecosystems cannot uh, keep up with the pace of, of climate change so we have to assist uh, nature we have to create new ecosystems we we are more clever than the ecosystem we know which species to plant we import them from other continents and uh, so this is worrying. So I feel we there is still the potential of, of worsening the situation. Uh, the situation is critical, but if we do not really understand how to work with the ecosystem, support them uh, to to well make use of of the um, resilience capacity, uh, we can do something counterproductive. I I have had the chance to travel a lot. Uh, also in the context of development cooperation, we have been doing projects and we are doing projects in various countries uh, and it always gives me hope that wherever we go, and this is uh, from South America to North Korea, from Russia to, to Europe, you always find people, you meet people who, who are committed to, to abate threats to, to nature and, and that uh, have this ecological understanding and uh, I feel now, yes, the situation is, is getting very critical, uh, but this also induces a rapid change in, in attitudes in many people. So I, I believe in non-linear change and, and the growth of a critical mass uh, so that we, yes, can come to, to this transformation that we so urgently need. Maybe as, as a scientist, uh, I'm, I'm increasingly uh, worried also about uh, scientists being too sure. So this has been something uh, relevant in, in various uh, discussions, maybe here also at, at the conference. Um, and uh, I, I feel if you really understood what, sci what science is, then we know we have hypotheses and, and uh, we, we test and uh, we never can claim that we have the truth. And this is becoming ever more difficult in, in rapidly changing situations. And, and we are going into unknown uh, territory now with the climate change. And so we should be much more careful. This is maybe a trivial insight, say, but this means often hands off. And uh, let us get a better understanding of, of what ecosystems do before we manipulate them. And, and like this, well, respect for uncertainty, I, I think maybe this is the biggest challenge also in, in the science policy interface, uh, scientists talking to society. As we know, science uh, is, is uh, yeah, trying to convey these complex messages, if, then, maybe, and so on, scenarios, and then policymakers get bored and don't listen, so then we are tempted to come up with very simple answers. And this is dangerous, yeah, because the, now there aren't any simple answers. I, I feel we can talk about uncertainty, but we have to do it. I, I recommend to uh, well, look at this from a, an evolutionary perspective. And, and what we know, of course, is that over time uh, we have a permanent growth of the global ecosystem. Growth in terms of all growth forms. Uh, which we know in ecosystem uh, theory, which is the biomass, it's the uh, well diversity, the information in, in the components of the ecosystem, and then also the network. And uh, we know, yes, that sometimes there have been reductions, so like catastrophes and, and so on, but afterwards the system was always coming back. And uh, we know that possibly nowadays we have as many species, for example, uh, as, as never existed on Earth. So what we see is that this functionality of Earth ecosystem has increased over time with all the setbacks and, and problems and, and catastrophes to be dealt with. Uh, and uh, so yes, we should be concerned if we now reduce uh, the very meta, the very components of, of this functional systems. And, and we unfortunately uh, reduce it on all fronts. I mean, we, we cut it into pieces, we, we uh, reduce networks, we 
uh, loose information that has been evolving over millions of years of, of, of time and uh, we are uh, eating up and, and burning biomass like hell.